Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today and always. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this past school year, Jennifer's car, it broke down for good. And while I haven't yet quite figured out if the car was just at the end of its rope, or if in fact Jennifer was really trying to steal my brand new truck, I have found blessing in it. Because we have only had one vehicle, I have often had to use Uber to travel. Using Uber, I've had some wonderful conversations with people I most likely would not have had it not been for the loss of a car. On one particular occasion, I was returning home from a class that I was taking at Wesley Seminary in DC. When I got in the car, the driver and I exchanged a quick hello, and then it was quiet for, say, five to 10 minutes. I knew by his complexion and his accent that he was Middle Eastern, and I placed him as being from somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. I can pretend to you that I did this just as a matter of course, but in reality, it was in fear of who he might be. After a while, because I could not handle the awkwardness of the silence, at least my own sense of the awkwardness anymore, I finally made a comment about the trees. Whatever I said to him puzzled him enough to suspect that I was not from the area, and so he asked me where I was from, and I said, Louisiana. He returned to me and said that the trees are so beautiful here, they remind him of home. Alas. This was my opportunity in, my way into finding more about this man. And so I asked, well, where is home? He replied, Northern Virginia. <laughs> I could not help but chuckle. Not satisfied, I prompted further, are you originally from here? Reluctantly, he told me that he was from Iran and that he had only been here just a couple of years. I suppose he was unsure if he was disclosing too much, and I was wondering, with all that's discussed in our country about Iran, terrorism, and immigration, how someone from Iran relatively recently just showed up in our country? I think why it's so unusual to me, and I think it's fair to say that over the course of history, both modern and ancient, he has often been a reason for suspicion in my community's wheat field, and I as well play the weed in his. Our parable today from Matthew seems quite relevant to our current day. To be fair, truly the course of human history. The human condition seems quite preoccupied with asserting its knowledge of who is in and who is out of our communities, further wanting to go to great length to discriminate, control, even at times eradicate peoples from the face of the earth. We as human beings create fodder, rules, necessary appearances that serve as proof of belonging to certain communities. However, we fail to realize that there is not a litmus test to being created by God. We simply are. Now I, for one, am becoming increasingly tired of the all too common tendency to seek and to categorize people into types or groups. I'm increasingly fearful of the human capacity of my own capacity to divide the people in this world according to some general standard. I'm tired of hearing that every black man shot by a cop must have had it coming, that every Muslim must support terrorism, that every Republican is a white supremacist. And let's be honest, the list nowadays just seems to go on, and each always come with an equally powerful retort. Have we not grown tired? 
When will we stop trying to be the ones who decide who is in and who is out of whatever boundary we are trying to enforce? Why do we think we know best who is wheat and who is weed? In this parable today, there is a glimpse of God as the gardener. Moreover, God has placed us in the field with each other, and we are told not to worry about the weeds. The gardener will gather up the wheat and the weeds and separate them. Thanks be to God, because that frees us up to be patient and to love all in the field. Now I'd like to begin by telling you another story, this time from the adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Quite a staple form of entertainment in my household these days. Most of us all know that deep in the Hundred Acre Wood lives Christopher Robin's childhood friends, a donkey named Eeyore, Kanga and Little Roo, Owl and a Gopher, Piglet, and most of all, Winnie the Pooh. However, the tale I want to tell you today has little to do with Pooh or even Piglet. It concerns itself with a rabbit and a tigger. Now, Rabbit is a masterful gardener. He takes great pride in his lettuce and his onions and his carrots. And Tigger, well, we all know what Tiggers do best, right? No? <laughs> they bounce. One day, Tigger, overjoyed to see Rabbit, bounces all over him and his garden causing Rabbit to become extremely upset. So upset that Rabbit calls for an emergency meeting to protest all bouncing. He recruits Pooh Bear and Piglet to join him in an effort to lead Tigger deep into the Hundred Acre Woods and desert him, leaving him never to be found. Clearly, Tigger is the weed in Rabbit's garden, and he intends to uproot him permanently. Now, unfortunately for Tigger, Pooh Bear is in some sort of honey-induced coma and in his stupor accepts Rabbit's request. And Piglet, well, Piglet is too fearful to stand up to Rabbit and not quite powerful enough to wake Pooh, and so he too submits. Therefore, a bear who is hardly awake, a fretful Piglet, and a cantankerous rabbit lead a joyful tigger out into the woods to be lost, to be lost from being himself. So deep into the woods do the three lead tigger that once they lose him, they become lost themselves, even separated from one another. And tigger, well, tigger never really becomes lost at all. He is even the one who winds up finding rabbit. And now for any of you rabbit lovers, I'm not accusing rabbit of being evil, but he is certainly preoccupied with asserting what Christopher Robin's community should look like. And in the community, he envisions that if you bounce, you should be out. Rabbit does not know how to reconcile his joy of gardening with Tigger's joy of bouncing and find a way for them to coexist. So Tigger, who doesn't fit into Rabbit's worldview, must be treated like a weed. He must be divided from the community. Thankfully for Tigger and for Rabbit, in Christopher Robin's imagination, there can be room for an overly joyful yet boundaryless Tigger, as well as a hardworking yet compulsion, overly compulsion-disordered Rabbit and a silly, lazy, honey-loving Pooh Bear, and a sweet yet timid Piglet, an academic owl who can quote the dictionary, yet in all his knowledge has not a tangible skill, a day-laboring gopher who's always ready to work, yet no one knows how he even got in the Hundred Acre Wood, because he's only in the movie, not in the book, <laughs> a single mother, Kanga and her adorable child, Rue, 
And lastly, a depressed donkey who might possibly be the most thoughtful of all of them. Christopher Robin puts all of them in the same wonderful wood and refuses to allow for the separation and dividing tones to win the day. Even Rabbit comes to see that Tigger needs to be Tigger and bounce, although perhaps not all over his tidy vegetable garden. And so it seems to me that when we speak in dividing tones, particularly the generically dividing tones that we so regularly do with these days, we risk losing ourselves in the process of identifying others. We become lost deep in the hundred acre wood that we no longer recognize our surroundings. And the wood and the trees that remind us of home are gone. The trees that remind us not of Northern Virginia, but that we are created in a field of gods and God wants us to find a way to love the whole forest. And today we must remember that through our baptismal vows, we are called to use those waters of baptism to water God's whole field with love, respect, and dignity. To remember to recommit ourselves to those vows, to teach our newly baptized, and to show all amongst us who are not baptized that we are dedicated to striving for a life not caught up in division, but caught up in love for all that God has created. You know, sometimes I have to admit that just like a rabbit, I too get lost. And there deep in the urban forest of the district, I assumed too greatly about the man who was driving me. I withdrew from my responsibility to love the whole wheat field. And my temptation was too great, and I had to figure out how my Uber driver, an Iranian, just relatively recently showed up in the States. He told me that he and his wife were both teachers back home in Iran. <laughs> However, he was an advocate of human rights, and so he was chased out of his country. He had to flee his homeland. He had to smuggle his family out, all because he sought equal treatment for people. And now he is here in the States holding certain qualities that are supposed to ring true in our country, ideals of family, of equality, and he cannot seem to muster enough support to become a teacher again. I sat back in the car quiet for most of the trip and I listened to this man. My own fear of those who are out was at play and I had to deal with the reality that much to my surprise, surely, surely Christ was in this man. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that it is not left up to me to decide who is a wheat and who is a weed. Thanks be to God that it is not left up to the responsibility of any government. Thanks be to God that it is not the church's responsibility. Thanks be to God that Jesus has affirmed to us that the kingdom is not some monolithic realm that exists only for identical things. It's a glorious tree grown from a mustard seed where you and I can take comfort and shelter. It's a place where every lost coin, every last bear and rabbit and tigger is found. And the kingdom, even when we get in the way of it, when we try to describe how it should be, God is infinitely patient with us. And now I believe faithfully and hopefully that we are forever and always being pulled closer to God. And I know on this journey we often distract ourselves, often by our self-interest or even the desire to impress God and claim what membership in the kingdom should look like. However, in this time, in our time, instead of focusing on 
who is in and who is out, can we begin to imagine that in the chaos, God forms and purposes a divine image reasoned and destined for this world to have? Can we imagine, truly imagine, that through Jesus Christ our Lord, all belong to God? Amen.